In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, seed of wisdom, for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Tim will be in the confessional for those who would like to go to confession um, uh, during the, at least during this first conference, and he may sit in there again, depending on how many people go to confession. So, the conference today is on prayer, with an emphasis on meditation. And what I want to talk about is uh, the various facets and aspects of meditation. St. Augustine said that if you do not pray, you will not be saved. Period. That's the way it works. No, if a person doesn't pray, they're simply not going to be saved. And the reason has to do with the nature of justice. There's different virtues, of course. Justice, uh, one of the sub-virtues to justice is the virtue of religion. And under the virtue of religion, St. Thomas says there's four acts, which we're not going to go into all of them today. But one of them is prayer. And so if you don't pray, you're not fulfilling the obligations of the virtue of religion, and then you're therefore not fulfilling the obligations of justice in relationship to God. So then people ask me, well, how much should I be praying the, in order to fill this requirement of justice? The general consensus among the theologians is, is that you should be praying at least 15 minutes a day to fulfill the requirements of justice, at least. But there's a difference between the order of justice and the order of charity. In relationship to charity, you actually have to, your obligations are greater. Our Lord says that to pray always. And if you love God, the more you love Him, the more you will want to be praying and be around Him all the time. Just as it is with any other human being that we might um, come across that we have a particular love for, that someone in our lives, like our spouse or someone like that, we want to be around them when we love them. In the same way, charity, which is the virtue by which we love God and love our neighbor for the sake of God, the more we love him, the more we will want to be with him. This is one of the reasons that it's important to have a rather developed spiritual life. If Christ says to pray always, that means, and this is a precept of charity, which means as a positive precept, we have to kind of work up to completing its fulfillment, unlike a negative precept, which we must never do, like uh, adultery applies everywhere in all cases. It takes a while for people to be able to perfect the positive precepts, to attain them and live them perfectly. However, when you're talking about the matter of justice, that is, binds everybody. And so it's not something you have to work up to. It's something you should be doing right now. This is one of the reasons why Our Ladies kept encouraging people to say the rosary. Because if you say the rosary, that's roughly 15 minutes a day. And so if you're saying the rosary every day, then you're meeting the requirements in justice. This is one of the reasons why she gives certain promises to those who say the rosary every day. But for charity, it means you have to kind of work up to it. The authors tell us, based upon what St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila discuss, and what the other various saints talk about, is that there's actually nine levels of prayer. The first level is vocal prayer. That's the one that's said out loud. The next one is, going to, is meditation, sometimes called contemplation. But I don't particularly like that nomination because it's not... Uh, it's normally restricted to a specific kind of prayer, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. But me then there's meditation, where there's nothing vocal, it's just purely mental. The definition of prayer is lifting your mind and heart to God. So you're actually lifting your mind and heart, and you're coming focused on Him. St. Thomas asked the question, well, what's the difference between that and studying something that pertains to God? And he says it has to do with their ends. With study, the end is to come to knowledge of God. But with prayer, it's to have union with God. Now, St. Thomas says that the principal effect of charity is union. So if you love God, you want to be one with Him. 
That being the case, in fact, he says this union is the principal effect of charity. That being the case, if you're praying, what's going to happen is, is over the course of time, you're going to start becoming closer and closer to him. Prayer is essentially the approximation in this life to the beatific vision. Because the beatific vision, which is what we have in heaven, is we see God face to face. Literally what happens is, is God takes himself, and I'm saying this as a lack of better way of saying it because our human language in discussing this is limited. He takes himself and he presses it on the spiritual part, the immaterial part of our intellect, and we have an intellectual vision of him and we see him immediately through that intellectual vision. Then St. Thomas says, once we see him immediately, there's a concomitant, immediate motion of the will to perfect love of him because he's all good. And so once we see that, the will can't help but love him. So that meant that that beatific vision, as we pray, we start to approximate that that happens to us once we get to heaven. The seeing God face to face, lifting the mind, and... Um, and the heart to God, then the will, which is the heart, moves towards him. So it starts taking on a, uh, a similarity of that which we have in heaven. As you ascend the levels of prayer, again, there's nine. As you ascend the levels of prayer, the levels of prayer start taking on more and more similitude to the way the beatific vision actually occurs. <clears throat> so first is vocal prayer, then mental prayer. Then there's what's called effective prayer. It's a form of mental prayer, except the difference is, is that it's a predominance on the will, where the person finds interiorly there's a burning desire to want to be with God. And so it's more on the side of the will, the authors say. Then there's what's called the prayer of simplicity. As you start removing all of your defects, and we're going to talk a little bit about defects later and how they impact prayer, but as you start removing all of your defects, what happens is as you start to pray, it becomes less discursive and you become fixed on contemplating some particular perfection in God or God himself without any kind of going from thing to thing. or th It's just you become fixed on it. People who start to enter into the prayer of simplicity will notice that they're having this kind of prayer only uh, after they come out of it. They don't notice it when they're in it. When they come out of it, what they notice is, is that they knelt down, they'll start praying, they entered into this, they remain fixed on that one thing, and then they come back out and they realize 45 minutes passed. So that process to come more and more fixed on one object is the necessary precursor to be taken over into mystical contemplation, which is supernatural. Mystical contemplation is not the prerogative of saints. It's the natural progression that every single person who's advancing in the spiritual life is supposed to obtain. So God will get, the, as a person becomes more holy, and that if some prayer of simplicity happens and they get to the point where they can remain fixed, then God will bring the person over into midst of contemplation because the other faculties of the soul aren't distracting you and dragging you all over the place. Once you enter into mystical contemplation, then there's five levels after that. One is just called super or supernatural infused contemplation. That's the first level. Then there's the prayer of quiet, prayer of union, prayer of conforming union as you advance up the, the levels. And then the final one is mystical marriage or the transforming union, where you're in a constant state of mystical contemplation. You never, the, the contemplation, this vision never leaves. And we know that this is the case in addition to John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and several other saints talking about it. But there was, for example, St. Margaret Mary one time said that by the time she was 24, she had already reached transforming union and you can't reach that until you have literally you and God have eliminated every single defect from your life and you have essentially stopped sinning and so when she reached that she talked about how she had this constant awareness of Christ's presence constant it never left so <laughs> Teresa of Avila says that meditation is the entryway to all the higher forms of prayer. People wonder why they're not becoming holy or advancing in the spiritual life. It's very simple. There is a direct correspondence between your level of prayer and where you're at in your spiritual life. A direct correspondence. There's also a direct correspondence between your humility and where you're at in your spiritual life. And there's also a direct correspondence between your charity and where you're at in your spiritual life. But in relationship to the prayer, 
if you have if you find meditation where you just kneel down and you're contemplating some perfection god or something like that we'll talk a little bit about the mechanics later if you're finding that difficult that actually tells you or you're not doing it very often but you're doing say a lot of vocal prayers that tells you you have not even gotten out of the first stages of spiritual advancement that's what that tells you meditation again tree says is the entryway to all of the higher entry points all the higher levels of prayer this is why every saint under the planet this is why every founder of any kind of society or order you know, like benedict saint francis all of these the heavy stress is on prayer and meditation because it's necessary to advance to all the higher levels in fact saint thomas says you cannot conquer venial sin without regular meditation it's impossible so if you're struggling with, uh, with uh, venial sin and you're not making any advancement, that tells you why. You're not making any advancement because you're not doing meditation. A lot of people shy away from meditation because of the fact that it's difficult. Now, sometimes I think it has to do with people's training. We're in a period in church history where for 40 or 50 years it was hammered into people's head that prayer is to be communal by nature and if you want to go off and pray upon it with your, on your own there's something disordered about that that's literally what people were told one of the difficulties we have is that we now have a liturgy in the church that is non-stop yakking and then what do they have to do they have to artificially impose periods of silence because the priest and the church realized something's wrong here because people aren't praying. People get into the habit because there's this non-stop yakking. Then what happens is, is as soon as this yakking stops, people think prayer is over. And then what do they do? They start yakking in the church and talking and walking around instead of doing what? Kneeling and doing thanksgiving after mass and praying in meditation upon the reception of communion. Then, of course, you got these theologians running around saying that, you know, when you receive communion, you don't go back and kneel and pray because, you know, our Lord would forbid anybody to pray alone with him because they say instead you should go back and you should stand until everybody else receives their communion. That's just absurd. The first thing that you should do when you receive Christ is immediately enter into meditation. That's the whole point of his presence in you. So meditation. Discursive meditation can be defined as a reasoned application of the mind to some supernatural truth in order to penetrate its meaning, to love it, and to carry it into practice with the assistance of grace. The distinguishing note of meditation is that it's a discursive type of prayer and therefore attention is absolutely indispensable. So if you want to meditate well, you have to arrange the circumstances so that you can pay attention interiorly. Now, usually when people become proficient in meditation and become really good at it, that is, they develop a habit. St. Thomas doesn't say that prayer is a habit. He says that it's an act of a habit, the virtue of religion. But it requires a number of different other habits to be in place in order for us to master it well. There has to be the habit of always rendering God as due. There has to be a love of God, which is in charity. There has to be custody of the mind. A person has to have custody of the mind in order to keep that under control, his mind under control. He has to have um, a, uh, a kind of a discipline of life and a spirit of mortification. We'll talk more about that later. But he has to actually have to get, so that he can maintain attention. To maintain that attention, normally when people are starting, they have to put everything aside, get to a quiet place where they can spend the 15 minutes in meditation. I always tell people, start out with 15 minutes of meditation. Start out with it. And if you can't do that, start out with You can break it up. It's so where you do 10 in the morning or 5 in the evening or something of that sort. But get to the point where you can do at least 15 minutes. Optimally, for the layman, you want to get to the point where you're meditating 30 minutes a day. We're going to talk about why you want to do that later. But this is this attention is indispensable, so you have to get to a quiet place. Now, I realize if you have children, this is going to be extremely difficult, but you're just going to have to like, get up a little bit earlier in the morning or stay up after um, the children go to bed or do it so that you can get to the point where there's that quiet place. I noticed that some um, uh, couples will do tag team, where one couple... <laughs> 
keeps the kids distracted and, and sequestered in one part of the house while the other one is able to pray and then they switch. And that's a good practice to actually do. You can meditate on various sub subjects. What is meditation? Meditation is essentially picking a doctrine of the church or a, like some perfection of God that he's omniscient, all-knowing, all-merciful, all-good, etc. Pick, picking one of those or picking some aspect of Christ. So the fact that, um, that he became incarnate. You can meditate on all the virtues of his human nature. The fact that he had a burning charity, that's the reason for the flame above his sacred heart, is that he had burning charity for us. So you can meditate on those various things, some perfection of Our Lady, some perfection of the saint, a particular uh, mystery of the rosary, or something like that, without actually saying it, but just contemplating it, some particular aspect of Christ's life. You can choose a number of different things. I find litanies very helpful because you can say, go through the litany until you find something that's easily meditatable and then you can do that, Just focus on that. But you choose it and then you look at, you basically, it's a way to, that, that doctrine or that teaching or that moral aspect is the means by which you're trying to see God in it and to, come one in him, come, to become one with Him. And so you'll look at him from a variety of different points of view, or look at that doctrine from a variety of different points of view. For example, God's goodness. Even in the worst kinds of lives, you can stand back and look at all the good things that God has done for you. So you can practice on developing the virtue of gratitude, which is a sub-virtue to the virtue of justice. And the virtue of gratitude, so you would look at how good God was to you. He's providing for you. He's providing a home for you. He's giving you grace. He gave you Catholic faith. He's actually giving you specific graces to start overcoming your difficulties. He might have given you a good spouse. The fact that he gave you the, the, the children. All of these things. You can look at that and look at him and look at how good he's been to you. Teresa of Avila once said that she spent an hour, I think it was maybe it was two hours, in meditating just on the words, Our Father. The words, not the whole prayer, just our Father. To looking at the various ways in which He's a Father to us. That He loves us. He's seeking out for what's good for us. He wants our consolation. He wants us to be with Him in heaven. He cares for us, etc. He's providence for us. And she spent literally an hour just on that one thing. So you look at it, and you look at it from a variety of different points of view. One can meditate on various objects. As I mentioned, some seen in the mystery of Christ's life, the virtues of Our Lady, the saints. A particular virtue to be acquired, or a vice that's to be uprooted, and the mercy that God is having you to give you the grace just to even see that you might have a particular vice. You can also t um, pray, one of the things that many saints would pray upon, or um, to meditate on, is the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity. When you are in the state of grace, when you enter into the state of grace, God creates in you a participation in divine nature. It's created, so it's limited. It's not divine nature itself, but it's a participation in divine nature. The Blessed Trinity is literally indwelling in your soul. And so as a result, you can actually meditate upon the fact that He is there. This is a very, very important point for people who have self-loathing or self-hatred and things of that sort. We're supposed to hate the sin and love the sinner, even in relationship to ourselves. What does this mean? It means not that we are selfish, which is a disordered form of self-love, which is a form of interested love, but it's a disinterested love that we should love ourselves, that we want what's good for us, because the definition of love is willing the good of another. We want the good for ourselves, and what's that good? Greater participation in God, our spiritual perfection, what's best for us spiritually. And so, but we can look at that indwelling of the Blessed Trinity and meditate upon His presence interiorly in us. And many saints have said they've found that even more beneficial than meditating on Him in His transcendence, even though that's a necessary component. You can also meditate on the sacraments and the things that you've gotten from the sacraments, the good that you've received from the sacrament of penance, the various aspects of the Mass. You can even take a prayer, one of the prayers of Mass and meditate on the contents of that. Also, the, the various forms of the liturgy, you can do that. Meditate on the Psalms, you don't necessarily, or some particular passage in Scripture. There's different methods of meditation. 
There's all sorts of different medita- methods of meditation. Many of the things that I'm talking about you can find in the book called The Ways of Mental Prayer by Lahodi. It's put out by Tan. It's one of the best. There's a variety of different really good books on meditation out there. But this is the one I recommend. It's a bit dry, but it's, it gives you the mechanics, what you do before you meditate, the things that you have to do to get to the point where you are meditating, what you do afterwards, what you do in the meditation, the things you have to avoid outside of meditation. He lays the whole thing out. It's a wonderful book. Again, it's a bit dry, it's thick, which usually is a bit daunting to people, but once they get through it, then they realize, okay, now I know what I'm doing. Most people will literally come to me and say, Father, I want to pray, but I don't know what I'm doing. Which is sad, because what does that tell us? It tells us that the priests and the bishop, those who are responsible for preaching in the church, have failed in teaching us the elementary aspects of prayer. This is one of the reasons why many of the popes recently keep drawing people's minds to prayers. You've got to get to, you have to, people have to be praying, but it doesn't seem to be being conveyed to people. In selecting a method of meditation, there's two extremes you want to avoid. The first is excessive rigidity in the method. The method is a means to helping you to meditate well, not the end. In other words, So, for example, one form of meditation is you take the four kinds of prayer. You start out with acts of contrition, then you move to gratitude, then you petition, and then finally just prayer or or, uh, lottery or uh, worship or contemplation of God, some mystery. So that's one form of meditation. But if you happen to kneel down and something has happened to you and you've, you know, you've learned some particular aspect of gratitude of God, when you enter into that meditation and you, you feel that prompting and the ease to be able to meditate on that for a while, you don't sit there and force yourself to go through every single step of the meditation. You just immediately enter into that. But you, sometimes you need that method to develop the habits so that your mind is more capable and your heart is more capable of easily entering into the contemplation. So excessive rigidity, you have to be careful with that. Excessive rigidity is also important because when you enter into things like effective prayer and the prayer of simplicity, there has to be a docility because effective prayer you cannot produce on your own. Vocal prayer and meditation you can do with, uh, with ordinary grace. But effective prayer and prayer of simplicity, you can also do with ordinary grace, but you have to receive the grace in order to enter into those levels of prayer. You cannot cause them on your own. They're the natural product of entering into uh, meditation regularly and then removing your defects. As you remove your defects, you'll start coming closer and closer to the prayer of simplicity. But when you start doing that, if you try and being too excessive in the rigidity of it, you're trying to control it. You have to be more open to God giving you the grace and leading you in your prayer. The other one is inconstancy. One of the things you see regularly, I'll ask my spiritual directors, are you meditating regularly? No. Usually after about two or three months, if they're not doing it regularly, I say, okay, look, I don't think you're really serious about your growth in your spiritual life, so either you start meditating regularly or I can't be your director anymore because I'm not, I'm not, I don't have enough, t- I'm not helping you by just kind of coddling you along. And because as a spiritual director, you have to be careful because there's some people who really aren't, aren't interested in their spiritual life. They're only interested in hearing their, getting their ears tickled, as St. Paul says, or as our Lord says, sorry. They just want their ears, I don't know, St. Paul, not our Lord actually, but they want their ears tickled because basically they just want to hear wonderful things about the spiritual life. Look, that's not my job here. My job here is to drag you, kicking and screaming, whether you like it or not, to the stage of perfection. That's my goal. All right. But inconstancy is a major problem. Now, the inconstancy is primarily due to a weakness of the will. St. Thomas asks, um, uh, uh, he says, what is inconstance? He says, basically, it's a weakness of the will in which the the person knows the right thing to do, but they choose not to do it. And so, and usually he says because of some kind of passion or distraction or what have you. And you'll see this all the time. People distract themselves and are in constant in their spiritual life all the time by doing very elementary things like, um, <clears throat> well, I think, I'll go, I think I'll go read now, or I think I'll go watch TV, or I think I'll go, and they're constantly feeling their mind because to distract themselves from that inner calling to prayer. Prayer is part of the natural law. The obligation the desire and the inclination all come from the natural law. When God designed us, 
this is part of that virtue of justice again, when God designed us, he created in us a set of faculties and placed in them inclinations to perform specific kinds of actions. Those actions, what he's inclining us to, tell us what he considers morally right and wrong, which can't be confused with the inclinations that we have because of the disorders of original and actual sin. That inclination means that if you don't do something to fulfill that inclination, it's just going to sit there and you're going to be miserable. There is a direct proportion between your level of prayer and your happiness in this life. If you're not happy, it's because you're not praying. It's that simple. Or you're not praying well. Or you're just sticking with vocal prayer. And so you have some sense of this happiness, but you're not going up. Why? Because perfect beatitude for man is the mystical contemplation, or is, the, is the beatific vision, and all these levels of prayer approximate that, so that's our means to happiness. So that inconstancy is a matter of the will. You have to just tell yourself, I'm going to do this. That's it. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start praying every day. And the minute you get those disordered inclinations from original and actual sin, you just have to be brutal and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go pray. Then, of course, when you pray, because you, very often when people first start praying, their appetites are all over the place. You know, they're like little screaming children. They kneel down. and They're just like, let's go eat. Let's go watch TV. Let's go this. Let's do that. Oh, by the way, did you write that down on your... Your, um, your note head about what you have to get at the grocery store. Literally, it's that way. I often tell people as a priest, you get distractions, even if you've been doing mental prayer for a long time. Teresa of Avila, who of course reached the, uh, the transforming union, complained of distraction at times. And you know, as a priest, you'll get the strangest kind of distractions at the, at the, at the time that you're even trying to hyper-focus. Like during the consecration, all of a sudden, what flows through your head is, Aren't those feet on the, or those little paws on my neighbor's cat cute? You know, you're just like, where did that come from? Right. So the point is, I mean, demons can distract us, obviously. They don't want us to do this. But the point is, is that you have to be willing to put up with distraction. Do not get discouraged because you're distracted. God will allow the distractions in order for you to conquer those lower faculties, but also to get you to, to test your constancy. Do you, love your, do you love him? Or do you love, do, have you had really good prayer and now you're distracting so you get discouraged? Does it mean that you're really in love with the feeling you get when you pray? Or are you in love with him? The focus has to be about him. Are you praying because you're getting some type of consolation out of it? If that's it, you're doing it all wrong. St. John of the Cross and all the saints say you use the, con the, the, the consolations as a means to becoming more unified with God, not as the reason you do your prayer. This is one of, why, one of the reasons why certain movements in the church and also certain forms of prayer where people are trying to get this spiritual high all the time are dangerous business. And I can tell you this is an exorcist. Very often what ends up happening is, is the demons will insert themselves into the process, give the person that sensible consolation and drag their spiritual life literally down the toilet. So you can't make those the mainstay. You can't judge the quality of your prayer based upon any consolations and not even the distractions because God is testing you. He's trying to see and he's trying to purify your will and your faculties through that process. So constancy. At the beginning of practice of prayer, it is generally necessary to adhere to some method because the soul very often doesn't know how to proceed in the life of prayer. As we progress in the practice of prayer, it is more at ease in conversing with God. The method becomes less and less important and eventually may even become an obstacle to further progress. Regardless of the method, all meditation can be reduced ultimately to a framework containing all the essential parts of meditation. That is, the consideration of some supernatural truth, the application of that truth to one's life, and the resolution to do something about it. If your prayer doesn't get you to the point where you are actually wanting to get your life in order, there's something wrong. The practice of meditation should be regular. That is, regimented at specific times. The why? When people become really proficient in prayer, they can do it any time, in any place, and under any circumstances, pretty much. But it takes a while to get to that stage. And in the beginning stages, you have to develop the habits to get your body and the lower faculties in the habit of doing specific things. That being the case, you have to get in a habit. 
which means that's not going to come if you don't have some kind of regimented life, which basically means what? You should have a general outline of what your life is going to be like. I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to clean up a little bit, then I'm going to go and I'm going to pray for half an hour, and then I'm going to do spiritual reading, and then, or some spiritual reading first, we'll talk about that, and then I'm going to uh, then take care of the children, etc. When the children go to bed, I'm going to do the, or, you know, say the rosary with the children before they go to bed, etc. There should be a regimented life, and it has to be habitual. And the reason it has to be habitual is because of dissipation. If we don't get into the habit of doing it every single time at the same, uh, every day, until we reach a level of proficiency, and even then, the people who have levels of proficiency, if they're not doing it habitually at the same time, find that painful. But if you don't have a regimented life, you're just going to dissipate. You're just not going to do it. You're not going to be constant. You're going to be all over the map with your, with your prayer life. You'll do it well some days, other days you won't do it. You'll probably go for long periods of time or you're not doing it. The duration. As I mentioned, you should start out with 15 minutes. Again, you can break it up. They say that priests should be meditating a minimum of 50, 30 minutes a day. Priests should be doing it a minimum of 30 minutes a day. I was talking to one priest one time and he said, you know, I decided to go to two hours of meditation a day. And he says, you know what I discovered is that second hour is when it really gets good. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that prayer should last as long as the soul is in the state of fervor and devotion. And that it should terminate when it can no longer be prolonged without tedium and continual distraction. Okay, so even when the distractions kind of come and go, he says continue where you just, it's, you, okay, you're not getting any fruit out of it. But if they come and go, you don't worry about it. You just keep doing it. Then people ask, well, what's the posture I should take during meditation? Should I be kneeling or should I be standing or what should I be doing or sitting? It is important, the posture, because of the necessity of recollection and attention in the discursive prayer. Some people will absolutely insist that they kneel for every form of their prayer, and while they're kneeling there, all they're thinking about is, my knees are killing me, my knees are killing me, my knees are killing me. <laughs> Which is just waste. Now, when you become proficient, and when your body becomes subjugated, as St. Paul says, I bring my body into subjugation, when your body becomes subjugated, it will kneel there, and you can do it without distraction. There's a founder of a society that I once met of a Carmelite order. And he asked me, this was on Monday, Thursday, he said, hey, let's go and spend um, the five hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament from seven o'clock when the Mass ends until midnight when, they, when you know, the, the, whole, the Blessed Sacrament is reposed. So I said, okay, good. So, of course, I bring various spiritual books to keep myself focused and trying to get through to make sure I can go the distance in the five hours. I got my rosary and all this stuff. He knelt down and did not move his head for five straight hours. Five straight hours, did not move at all for five, because he was in front of me. This guy obviously had already, I'm convinced he, was in, he had entered into mystical contemplation, but he definitely had the prayer of simplicity. But he could do that because of the fact that he had regimented his life and his lower faculties so much that they were subjugated. And as soon as he entered into prayer, that was it. They just shut up and he was able to focus. But most people aren't that way. It takes time to get there. So you, the thing you have to do is, it's true that kneeling is a more reverential level of uh, more reverential posture. But if the goal is union with God, and that's things that's, it, and the kneeling is coming between you and God, then you should sit down or take another position. I don't recommend laying down because then it's just going to turn into watching your, uh, inside of your eyelids. Right. But you do want to take a, a posture that will actually is not distracting you, and you can maintain your attention. Some people do find it uh, efficacious to kneel while, uh, or to meditate while kneeling, but for others, it just, as I said, just causes distraction. So you can remain seated while doing it. The, the, there's two extremes that you want to avoid in a posture. The first is the excessive mortification side. This is just painful. I, you know, my back is killing me. You got to avoid that. On the other hand, excessive comfort. Because if you get excessive comfort, then the body's tendency is to want to sleep or to just, you know, vegetate. Meditation is the entry point, as I said, to all the higher levels of prayer, according to St. Teresa of Avila. 
if you're finding that you're stalling in your spiritual life, in fact, if you're finding that you can't seem to overcome some little imperfection or some venial sin that you're habitually confessing every month or every week that you go into confession, what that tells you is, is that the meditation, that you're not meditating, because one of, there's, there's various effects of meditation. One of them is, and it, there's a mechanistic reason for it. It's why people who do transcendental meditation get the same effect. And that's basically this. As you focus your mind on something, all our emotions are moved by what's in our imagination. So as you're meditating on something that's not the proper object of your emotions, over the course of time, the emotions will start quieting down. And so people who do any form of meditation, whether it's purely natural or it's actually supernatural like we do, where you're just actually trying to focus on God, will experience that effect on a mechanistic level. But there's one primary difference between their form of meditation and ours, and it has to do with the object of meditation. Their object of meditation is either something disordered or it's nothing. Like the Zen Buddhists, they contemplate nothing. Well, from nothing, nothing comes, is the general uh, philosophical principle. If there's nothing that you're contemplating, you're going to end up with nothing in your head, ultimately. And your spiritual life is going to end up to nothing. Yeah, you might get these faculties to be more quieted down, but there's not going to be anything there upstairs. Okay. Whereas with ours, it's that the object is, is something different. There's also, it causes order. One of the things that is becoming more and more alarming, I watch this every single day in our culture. Our culture is literally slipping into insanity. And I don't say that lightly. Literally, people in our culture are becoming mentally insane. And the reason they're becoming mentally insane is because their entire lives are entirely governed by their passions and their emotions. The problem with those is they're all over the map. And they're completely contradictory, which leads to a form of insanity. St. Paul says, you know, I bring my body into sub subjugation. Our emotions are part of the body. You have to get your emotions under control if you're ever going to advance spiritual life. And you just have to have emotional control if you're going to remain sane. The problem is, is this is being brought now into the church as the, that people don't think a form of spirituality is authentic unless there's all these emotions that arise out of it. The liturgy isn't good unless people get some type of emotional thing out of it. One time one of my relatives came out of Mass and said, well, I didn't get anything out of that Mass. And I said, that's okay. In fact, that's good. And she, she looks at me and I just said, as long as God got what He wants, we're all okay. But if you get what you want out of it, then He didn't get what He wanted out of it. So the point, but the point is, is that now it's becoming so entrenched in people's spiritual lives that it's actually becoming a disorder. The demons can actually move your emotions. And as a result of that, they can actually make you, make you think you're more spiritually advanced than you are. Perfection in a human being comes when there's no antecedent appetite which means that you will that all your lower faculties are absolutely and perfectly subordinated to reason and never move unless reason says to move. Prayer has a direct impact on that process, not just mechanistically in the way that I mentioned before, but the order. St. Augustine gave the classical definition of peace, the tranquility of order. It's the quietness that results when your lower faculties and your, all your interior life is rightly ordered. What are we ordered to, both according to the natural law and by grace, we are ordered to God. So as we're praying and we're focusing on Him with regularity, then what happens is, is that there's a peace that tends to take over interiorly. If you're finding interiorly you're not at peace, there's why. You're not... Uh, meditating and you're not praying regularly, if you meditate regularly, you'll start to notice this tremendous peace come over you. That's something you notice in the people who don't do Christian meditation, but these other forms of meditation, they might have their appetites a little quieter, but they're not orderly. You poke the guy, and the next thing you know, he's biting your head off. Whereas the person who does Christian meditation, because the lower faculties are learning the, their place in relationship to God and in relationship to reality, when they, when they get poked, they just sit there because they realize it's not my place to move unless reason says I'm supposed to. 
You're never going to conquer antecedent appetite unless you have them. Our Lady and our Lord had no antecedent appetite. This is one of the reasons why she could meditate so perfectly. So that's, one, that's just one effect of meditation. It'll rightly order your interior life. You'll be more at peace. You'll be happier. Second, by lifting your mind and heart to God, if you're in the state of grace, it's a meritorious act, which means you will be raising your place in heaven as a result of it. Your prayers will become more efficacious. Fulton Sheen was asked by priests one time, why is it that when you pray for something, it comes about very quickly, but when I pray for it, it never happens? And he says, because I make a holy hour every day. That's the difference. If you're meditating every day, you're going to become holier. You're going to be receiving sanctifying grace, and God's going to be uh, purifying your soul of its imperfections. Prayer is, in a certain sense, a form of mortification because of the fact that, the mortific- that through it, the, the, the lower faculties are becoming more sub- subjugated, which is the whole point of mortification. Mortification comes from the two Latin words, mors factory, to make dead, which means that the lower faculties do not have a life of their own but are only have a life within reason and as reason is illumined by faith. So your prayer will become more efficacious. you become holier. Your appetites are going to become more orderly. Another thing that the saints talk about is the fact that as that starts to occur and you're doing meditation regularly, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are going to become more active in your life. You're going to see the truth of the Catholic faith more intuitively, clearly. The, the absolute reality of the fact that they are true will become more manifest in your mind. You'll gain the gift of knowledge more, where you'll be able to judge the world and things more in the light. You'll see them from God's point of view, not from a worldly point of view. In fact, if you're looking at stuff from a very worldly point of view, it's a sign you're not meditating. It's also the reason I started out today with Our Lady's Seat of Wisdom is because wisdom is the highest virtue of the intellectual virtues in which a person is able to see God the way God sees himself. St. Thomas Aquinas says that you cannot have active wisdom where you see God the way God sees himself without supernatural Catholic faith. He says, a single heresy corrupts the virtue of faith. And he says, well, why do the people still believe in Christ if they don't believe in his church? And he says, it's called opinion. These people do not have supernatural faith. They have opinion. That means that because they only have opinion, they will never understand God the way God understands himself. This is one of the reasons why I'm always nervous about when they're talking about, we need to change the liturgy, we need to change this and do that and do this, do that and do this. Okay, look. There was a general principle that the liturgical changes, to make a liturgical change was the prerogative of the saints. And we're not talking about your run-of-the-mill people here. It's not just because you're a member of the magisterium. It has to do with the fact that you're a saint. Why? Why did they used to say that? Because a saint is someone whose entire life is focused and centered around wisdom. Wisdom is defined as the virtue by which I'm able to judge God and the things that pertain to God the way God sees them. If I'm not a saint, the introduction into the liturgy of the things that I want or what I think are going to be the product of natural human endeavor. They will not be the refinement that we saw over centuries that God wanted. This is one of the reasons why, you know, when you, if you get on YouTube and you type in call to action um, and just type in masks or puppet masks, you got these puppets floating around at Mass, with these gargantuan heads floating back and forth while there's a liturgical dance going on, and you're like, and, and this is your version of worshiping God? You don't even understand Him. You don't even understand your relationship to Him. Why? Because they're not praying. That's what it really boils down to. Fulton Sheen, one time, a priest came to him and says, I want to leave the priesthood. Fulton Sheen's first question to him is, when did you stop praying? And the guy said, about a year ago. So then the guy said, but I'll stay on until you, the, the priest said, I'll stay on until you find someone who says, no, don't bother, leave, I'll cover for you. Because the life of the priest, if he's not praying, this is what's going to happen. 
if his focus is himself and not God, then it's then that's what's gonna that's what's that's gonna become a real problem. One time an exorcist during one of these sessions, they discovered that what Christ wanted was, among other things, is for the, uh, everybody involved to develop the virtue of humility. And so the exorcist started saying these prayers, the litany of humility, and he was dragging the demon and making the demon contemplate each of the individual aspects of humility. And at a certain point, the priest stopped because interiorly he received a grace from Christ and said, stop drawing people to yourself and draw them to me. And basically, well, he, he didn't hear the words, but what he was shown is, get out of the way. It's a real temptation as a priest, especially in certain forms of the liturgy where everyone's looking at you and everyone's paying attention to you and everyone's lauding you all the time, even though behind your back they're probably bad-mouthing you. And everybody is, uh, you know, everyone is being kind and nice to you to actually think that somehow you're special. The problem is, is that that temptation then, you start doing things and you're fashioning your priesthood to make people like you. I don't want to say something from the pulpit about contraception because if I do, then people are going to get angry with me. So what? But the point is, is that that temptation, this is one of the reasons why Mass said ad orientum is so good because it allows the priest to die to himself and be focused. But the priest, and this is something that you'll notice, Priests who start meditating regularly and are meditating and praying regularly actually find that saying Mass oriented is actually more in tune with where their spiritual life is at. So it's a matter of order. It's a matter of right order. You're not going to have the virtue of wisdom if you're not meditating regularly and you don't have supernatural Catholic faith. If you want to pick and choose from the Catholic faith, you will never meditate well. And, because you're not receiving the grace to meditate well, you have to ask God for the grace to meditate well. And you have to keep asking Him. You have to keep pestering Him. One time, before I got into bed, I said to Christ, I said, make me a man of prayer. A month later, I was asked to be an exorcist. And then, I almost turned to Him and said, well, this isn't quite what I asked for. <laughs> but it makes you do it. One priest one time who does exorcisms once said in the presence of me and another priest, he said, when you become an exorcist, you get to the point where you realize you have to physically force yourself to pray regularly because if you don't, you will get taken to the woodshed. Well, that little woodshed is something we're going to talk about in the next conference of what's going to happen if you don't pray regularly. But the point is, is that if you really want to be happy, if you want to enter into this, these higher levels of prayer, mystical and contemplation, if you want to overcome your defects, if you want to get to the point where you see reality the way God sees it, you see Him the way God sees Him, and instead of looking at your religion from the point of view of your own selfishness, but you're just focusing on what does God want for me? I don't care what the cost is, that's what I want. You're never going to reach these levels until you get to the point where you're meditating every single day. And part of that comes down to one basic thing. When you stand before God at your final judgment, He's of course is going to drag you through all your entire life and show you all the things that you did wrong and all the things that you did right. But one of the things that's going to happen is, if you're not meditating or praying with Him every day, you're not going to have any kind of companionship or familiarity with Him. God is not that much different from us. The natural inclination that he placed in us to want to be around the people that we love is really a reflection of him. He wants to be with us. He wants our salvation. He wants us to experience his mercy, which requires means we have to be sorry or stupid, depending on whichever the case is. But we have to be, we have to be willing to be with him. He wants us to be with him. Just like it is if we really love somebody, but they, they refuse to spend any time with us, eventually our love grows cold for that person. Now God's love doesn't grow cold for us, but the effects of his charity, his love for us, begin to wane in our lives. And when you stand before him in the final judgment, he has to ask himself, do you really want to be with me? You never spend any time with me at all in this life. Why do you want to be with me in the next? 
Usually it's because people are thinking, they're looking down like, ooh, that's a hot place, I don't want to be going there. You know, the other side of it is too is, and then we'll end with this in this conference. When you die and stand before God, the first thing the saints say, the first thing that God communicates to you is your absolute need to see Him to be happy. Absolute, absolute need to see Him to be happy. It is impossible to be happy for those who live in this life. It's impossible to be happy without Him in the next. Remember when I was talking about that inclination from the natural law to prayer? You know, I should pray. If you're praying regularly, that happiness is going to start taking place in your life. But if you don't, you're going to start already feeling that need already. That's the need He's already prompting you. The difference is, is when you stand before Him, truth itself, God reveals to you, this is what you need. In order to have that thing fulfilled, the person has to see God face to face. In fact, they say that the, one of the, the, the primary suffering in purgatory is this separation from God and having that absolute knowledge and need to see Him. But if you, but if, if you are praying regularly in this life and fulfilling your obligations in relationship to this life, then God will start to give you a semblance of that happiness that you're going to get in the next life. You won't suffer that craving all the time, although there will be times that he'll give you another kind of burning for him, which is a different kind of craving. But that craving is more immersed in the happiness that he's going to give you. And it'll finally have its fulfillment in the next life. If you are in the habit of spending time with him, he's not going to say, you know, it, it's the same thing with us. If somebody keeps coming to us day after day after day and they're knocking on our door and says, hey, you want to hang out? And they really like us. And eventually, when the time, we want them to be with us too. We're not going to just cut them off. It's the same thing with God. If you're constantly hanging around him and pestering him almost, then when it comes time for your final judgment, he's going to want to be with you as well. If you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedicta Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Supervos et Manet Semper. Amen.